This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, so once that energy actually hits the ground, what happens to it? Basically, there's four things. You know, four things preventing the soil from getting too hot, or in fact, letting the soil get hot. There's basically four things. There's re-radiation, evaporation, conduction from that material to the air layer above or from that soil, or conductance from that surface to the subsurface. Okay, so let's go through all four of these. Re-radiation is basically what it sounds like. I've got energy coming in, and the object is then going to re-radiate. This is the short wave coming in and the long wave going out. Okay? You can certainly imagine, depending upon how much radiation is coming in versus re-radiation, that this could actually be heating up a system. In this scenario, the arrow represents the amount of energy that's coming in. Okay? Or the, amount of, amount of, the arrow represents the amount of energy being moved. Okay? So if the arrow is pointing down, this is significantly more amount. If the arrow is large, there's more energy coming in. Okay? This arrow is a lot larger than this one, so this system is heating up. Versus at night, or a frost, or a dew, or something like that, where the arrow, the arrow compared to the re-radiation, the energy is actually more energy is leaving the system than coming in. So the soil is cooling off. Imagine the nighttime. Evaporation is exactly what it sounds like. This is the heat of evaporation, the cooling of water through evaporation. Basically, it removes the heat from the soil <coughs> and the air by basically the latent heat of, vaporiz of, of vaporization. Okay, it cools the system down. It also cools the plants, and it will also cool down wet soil surfaces. Okay? It has a little ability. If, the, if I don't have any water, it's not going to dry up. It's not going to cool up anything that's dry. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? If I don't have any water, I'm not going to have any evaporation. And if I don't have any evaporation, it's not going to work. Okay. The next one is basically conduction of that to the air. Okay? Now, this has a lot to do with the surface, the nature of that surface. The more surface area I have, the more ability I have to conduct that heat off. Does that make sense? So if I have a convoluted surface versus a flat surface, I have more surface area here. Right? And if I have more surface area, this is the roughness of that material, the more surface area, the more points that I have to exchange that heat. Okay? The next thing is the gradient. Okay? It's going to be a lot faster when I have a gradient of extreme temperatures. Okay? If this is hot and this is hot, I'm not going to have a lot of exchange. But if this is hot and this is cold, there's going to be a lot of exchange. Okay? Another really good example of this is, okay, forget about hot versus cold. How about hot versus an air moving through the system? Wind. Classic example, classic experiment. They, did, they do this to kids all the time little in, in grade school. And they take an ice cream cone, and they have a fan. And they say, OK, now if I put this ice cream, how am I going to keep this ice cream from not melting? Which is going to be faster, if I hold it here or I put a fan on it? OK, because everybody's used to, if I put a fan on me, I'm going to get cool, right? But what's happening there? When the fan blows on you, I'm bringing in so it's pseudo evaporation. I'm bringing in air. I'm blowing it across your surface area. So in essence, I'm increasing through speed your surface area. Okay, if I stand here and the air is, not, is still, I have a certain amount of surface area. But if I blow a fan on me, I'm exchanging the air that's around me with new air. Okay? And if this air that's around me is warmer, it's likely that the air, because I'm heating it up, Right? This air is like 70 degrees, and I'm 98. Okay, so the, I'm heating the air up around me. Okay, so if I put a fan on me, I'm going to get rid of that hotter air that's around me and introduce cooler air. Right? So let's use the, the ice cream cone. I put the ice cream cone out there, and I ask the kids, if I have this ice cream cone, which, if I put the fan in front of it, or I don't put the fan in front of it, which one of these scenarios is the ice cream cone going to last longer? And they every, it's almost guaranteed, every time the kid says, you put the fan on it, it's going to stay cooler. It doesn't work that way, though. Why? What's happening? You actually make it melt faster. But why? 
So the ice cream cone has basically cooled the air around it. Okay, it was, the air was hot, and then it cooled. Okay, because the gradient is not as much, it's going to melt slower. It's not going to not melt, but it's going to melt slower. But what happens when I put that fan on it? I drive the cool air away from the ice cream cone and introduce more hot air, which means the gradient is more extreme, which means the ice cream is going to melt faster because it's cooling the air around it. Does that make sense? Conductance to air. Go. Uh, what's the difference between radiation and conductance to air? Uh, the one is a temperature, and one is a wavelength. Short, long wave wa wavelength versus sensible heat. OK? All right. The same thing applies to, I mean, I can transfer heat upward into the air, but I can also transfer heat downward, right? OK, I heat a surface over here. It, that heat is going to migrate through the material. OK, so this occurs only when the soil surface is hotter than the subsurface. And it reverses when that temperature profile switches. So if it gets hot down below and the surface starts getting cooler, the, the energy is going to be transferred upward. Does that make sense? Yeah? OK. Questions so far? Which brings us back to this concept of heat capacity. Okay. Heat capacity is basically a measurement of how much energy or how much heat an object needs to absorb before it can change temperature. Okay. We measure it basically in one degree Celsius. So it's usually expressed as a bulk volume. Okay. I have a volume of material, you know, a, a cubic centimeter of material. How much energy does it take to be converted in? And this is exact, converted to a temperature change. This is the exact same measurement as calories, by the way. Okay, one calorie, I think I have it in here. The specific heat of water, eh, a little bit differently, but basically one calorie per gram. Okay, so it takes one calorie of energy to heat up one gram of water one degree. Okay. Okay, this is the amount of heat capacity the water has. Okay? It increases with bulk density. You can certainly imagine as a material gets denser and denser and denser. Same material, but you densify it, if that's a word. It's going to increase the amount of energy that you need to heat that object up. Does that make sense? There's more material there in the same volume. Okay? At constant bulk density, it will increase with water content. Now, we're talking about soils here. So remember, we're talking about this whole volume. There's a lot of pore space in that volume. So if I put other materials into this given volume, and it doesn't have to be water. It could be, be any kind of liquid or any kind of mixture of material. You know, As I start a volume and I start adding other things into it, those other things are going to be adding their specific heats as well. And so my volume is going to take more energy to heat up. OK, so let's go back to the soil. I have a volume of soil, and it's bone dry. It's going to take a certain amount of heat to heat it up, a certain amount of energy to heat it up. But if I add water to it, it's actually going to take more energy to heat up that same volume. Right? Questions? OK. The heat, the specific heat, is the heat capacity expressed per that unit mass, i.e., the calorie in water. Okay, the specific heat of minerals is about 0.2 versus one calorie for water to get it move, to move up one degree. Okay, the results of this are if you think about a soil with a, a large heat capacity, that's uh, like a dense or a wet soil, if they are in the same location as a dry soil that's less dense, which soil is going to dramatically change temperature? If it takes more energy, to heat up the dense soil than it does to heat up the dry soil, or the, the, the less dense soil, which soil is going to change temperatures more dramatically? The one that takes the less energy, the less dense one, the dry soil. Does that make sense? Yeah? OK. <coughs> the heat capacity is very dependent. Therefore, I mean, so think about this. That heat dependency, or that heat capacity, is very dependent on the soil water content then. And it's also very dependent on the total heat capacity of that material. So I have a single material, and then I add more material. 
Okay, if I have one material, let's take a step back. I have two different materials. One has a larger heat capacity than the other, i.e. it takes more energy to heat it up. Okay, and then I add water to both of those systems. Water is just going to attenuate the heat change. It's just going to make it longer or harder. It, uh, da, da. It's going to make it more, I, I'm going to need more energy to heat these things up. So the water in both cases has the same amount of heat capacity. And if I add it to a system that has less heat capacity versus the one that has more heat capacity, I'm just going to make both of them go up. But the one that has less heat capacity, the material that we started with that has less heat capacity, is still going to have less heat capacity than the other one in a wet system. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, OK. The result of this is, well, okay, here's, I put these in here just so you can sort of see some, some comparisons. Heat capacity of sand is 0.3. Heat capacity of water is 1. Heat capacity of air, because there's not very much stuff in here, is 0.003. Okay, just so, to, get, to give you a sort of a, an image of this. The result is, when you start adding up the heat capacity, you basically have to add up all three the solid, the liquid, and the gas, put them together into that volume, and that is your heat capacity for that volume. Okay? The gist of this, though, is because this heat capacity is so, so low, you really just have to add these two together to get the heat capacity of a soil. Make sense? OK, now let's take a stop. Well, let's take a, a moment here and think about heating. Okay? Um, who here has a house or an apartment or a dormitory that's basically heated by forced hot air? It's hot air that's being driven through your system. Okay. Now, who here has a system that's being heated by water? Either radiants or radiant radiators or radiant floors or something like that. Okay. Now, which one of those systems does it take more energy to actually heat up the object that's doing the heating for everything else? Okay. So. Basically, we have air versus water. Which one of those takes more energy to heat up? Water. OK. Now, we haven't talked about this yet, but think about this. Which of those systems is actually more efficient? Water. Why? It takes longer to cool down, but the other really kind of cool thing we haven't talked about it yet, is this is how much energy it takes to heat something up. But this object, in turn, can heat other things up by transferring that energy. And that term is what we call heat conductance. This is heat capacity. The capacity, I mean, how much energy it takes to actually heat something up. But once you've got it heated up, what happens to it? Well, it transfers that energy to other things. And that term is heat conductance. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.